Elena Peach, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, nice to uh, virtually be here with you. Absolutely. So you and I were talking before the show and what I said, one of the things that I found interesting about you was you went from journalism to the mixed reality world. And I was asking if that was what got you to being open to connecting with people. You want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So a little bit about me is my background originally was in journalism. And in 2015, I attended a journalism conference and I went to a session by Google News Lab on 360 video. So they gave everybody at the session a cardboard headset and you slapped it on and you were undersea, uh, traveling above mountains, going to different countries. And it was at that session that I just thought, wow, this is an incredible storytelling tool. I want to learn more. I want to make these. I think if you can bring your viewer into this environment where they're distraction free and they feel like they're there, they'll want to know more about the story and want to dive deeper. And I made 360s for about a year and a half. And then I wanted something more interactive. And that's how I found myself working in the VR and AR space. So when it comes to connecting, uh, the same way in journalism where you really need to be open to a variety of different people and listen to who has what type of story to tell, I think that the virtual reality and augmented reality industry is growing. And it's just the type of exciting space right now where even if you haven't met in real life, if you both have that same passion, you can eagerly connect with others and talk about what brought you to the space, what you're doing here, what type of projects or products are you creating? And it's just an awesome space to be in. Everybody that I've talked to thus far and all of the reading that I've done, it is one of the most open, emotionally speaking, from person to person bonding industries I've ever come across, which is really interesting. What, what was your, so you started with the 360 video. Mm -hmm. What was that crossover into getting more into the space? Yeah. So I worked and made 360 videos for about a year and a half. Um, that year I had went to the 2016 presidential inauguration with PBS NewsHour to do some reporting. So getting quotes, taking pictures. Um, and while I was there, I thought this is going to be such a unique environment because you have the inauguration one day and then the Women's March on Washington the next day. And I decided to buy a 360 camera and just film the two environments and make some videos about the, just the dichotomy between the two places. And then from there, um, I did some 360 videos for a couple of different independent journalism outlets, but I wanted something more interactive. The issue, at least right now with where we are with 360 technology um, is you can see the space, but you can't step around, you can't step inside, you can't pick up the objects. Um, and so I began to learn more about VR and AR tech. And I then used my journalism skill set to work in marketing. And for about two years, I was the marketing manager for the Glimpse Group. Glimpse Group is a virtual reality and augmented reality platform company based in New York City. And they have eight different companies in the portfolio, and they're all focused on using VR and AR for enterprise solutions. I did marketing for about two years, even did some project management while I was there, but I knew marketing wasn't for me. Marketing was really just the way that I could apply my journalism skill sets to get that foot in the door. Hmm. And from there, I've pivoted to my new company where I'm at, Amp Creative, and I'm an experiential producer. And I absolutely love the company and I'm working on a lot of really different projects. And, and what does an ex experiential producer do? What does that entail? Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's very abstract right now. Um, Fun job. But the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, you, know, you just wear many hats and you got to figure out how to solve the problems. Um, but ideally, as we get more clients that are interested in working with immersive technologies, I will be one of the first producers to jump onto the projects. Um, and I guess I should take a step back and explain what a producer does. And the producer is really the person that's making sure that the project happens. And not only does the team know what's going on, but the client is aware too, and that the creative vision is being executed and that we're following the timelines, following the budgets, um, that we're developing the best experience, video, um, game, training experience um, that the end client is looking for. And so when it comes to the VR and AR space, I can't give the full details too much about this project. So I'll just be a little abstract. 
um, but a client is coming out with a piece of hardware and we are developing some a piece of hardware that will be sold to consumers across the world. And we are developing some AR training experiences that employees at the store selling this hardware will use. And so the employees will consume the AR training experience to understand more about this hardware device and its capabilities and what are the selling points that they'll tell to consumers. So for there, you know, we need to make sure that we're communicating to who our end client is, this big company, also communicating to our developers that we're building the right things that we need to build and also thinking about who are these different users that we're working with. This isn't a commercial experience that will be available worldwide to anybody and everyone, but instead the specific group of users who will be these retail employees. Got to ask, so in the, in the current environment, how, how are we thinking on that project about sanitation and keeping that headset clean? What's mm -hmm. involved with that? Yeah, well, so this one is AR. So the nice thing is that it can all be accessed on the employee's individual device, okay. um, which is good for the sanitation end. But when it comes to VR experiences, um, we're not deploying any right now. Um, but I'm just thinking about previous experiences done in the past and you would have the wipes, or maybe even you're doing some type of uh, module where you would mail a headset to a person's house, then mm -hmm. they get to try the training experience and then they mail it back to the company, company cleans it and then mails it out again. Now a system like that is hard to do at scale, but during the initial stages of COVID, you know, we need to be creative with our problem sure. solving. So does AMP focus mostly on the, the training aspect or are they also working on the B2C development piece too? Mm -hmm. I would say um, AMP Creative is around 18 years old and they originally started off as a traditional production company, and then pivoted into making e-learning videos and then became e-learning strategists and specialists. And so they still do all these different verticals. So commercial production, even independent production, uh, e-learning videos, e-learning strategy and development, which is a lot of where most of these projects are at today. And now looking at how we can use new technologies for learning and training purposes. So right now we're not the big developers of making different software or hardware, but we're utilizing the tools that are available in order to make experiences for our end clients. Got it. And what are some of those, without giving away any of mm -hmm. the secrets, of course, maybe even just from what you've heard secondary and tertiary, what are some of those solutions to the problems that you see businesses trying to solve right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right now, when it comes to looking at virtual reality for training purposes, and I will admit that I have a bigger bias towards virtual reality over augmented reality, just because personally... I think that there are a lot more opportunities and possibilities that you can do with the space. And right now, most people are limited to accessing AR on their phone and the full capabilities for mobile devices aren't there quite yet. I mean, the iPhone in uh, November of last year came out with the LiDAR update uh, for the iPhone. And then even about a year ago, they did the same LiDAR update for the iPad, which is really awesome for AR, but I think it will take a little bit more time for AR devices to catch on and to have a wide range of capabilities, but at least on the VR and there's a lot of really awesome things that we can develop and build for. So for the business to business end, looking at the training and learning standpoint, VR is a really great tool for soft skills. Hard skills, it seems as if there's more research that needs to be done just because you need to have a really high fidelity, high detail simulation, then also you need to have a company that's willing to test it out. And you might not find a company that says, okay, let's have all our employees learn how to install airplane hangers and AR and VR and then actually implement it. So hard skills, yeah. a little bit slower, but soft skills, there's a lot of really interesting studies going on in the space because you can put somebody in a virtual environment and they can practice a variety of different things like negotiating, um, giving business presentations, giving business pitches, even practicing having tough conversations with employees, whether it be a discussion about uh, hiring, firing, um, harassment in the workplace. And for us, um, I can talk about a project that we completed for a client that 
I can't say who this client is, sure. um, but it was a immersive video and VR experience on bias in the workplace. And this client deployed the experience to their employees and they found a lot of really successful results. And um, what we actually ended up doing is we took the base of that experience and we changed out the content. So it wasn't the same information that that end client used, but we put it out on the Oculus app lab. And so if you want to try to download it, you can go and look for um, perspectives from Amp Creative and it's there. And um, the experience is you put on the headset, you then see different stats talking about how people are impacted by bias in the workplace. And there's one thing about reading stats. Okay, you can understand the numbers, but then afterwards, you then step into the shoes of a woman of color in a meeting with three um, male colleagues and one older white female colleague. And you can read the stats, but it's different from when you're actually experiencing it from somebody's point of view. And so you see what it's like for her to be in this workplace scenario where her ideas are being shut down or she's not being taken seriously or people are talking over her. And then afterwards, you're given a new set of stats. Um, and we'd love to continue to do more of these type of DNI exercises in VR because there's just so much power when you really get to step in someone else's shoes. Empathy seems from, or at least that's what stands out to me across the board as the biggest lesson learned when using virtual reality technologies. I've read about empathy with sex trafficking, your use case of work workplace um, homelessness. Um, recently, I had a conversation around somebody who was put into solitary confinement, mm -hmm. and so have it. So it doesn't seem like the human mind has to have that high of fidelity to create the emotional bond, which is what I'm thinking right now is what the at least for me, the biggest impact of virtual reality. Is that, what are, what are you seeing yeah, from an emotive? I definitely see that as a huge impact. And even when it comes to cognitively, how we think and how we learn, you know, we evolved from other animals and they did not have writing or video, even looking at human cavemen, really we had maybe very abstract cave art but most of the way that we retained and gained information was by observing others and interacting with others. And so we tend to have more of a spatial memory where we can be in a situation and we can recall more details better because it feels as if we're there. I mean, I think even if I asked you to tell me about a place you've traveled to, maybe you won't be able to give me a line item of everything on your itinerary of 10 o'clock I went here, 11 o'clock I went here, 12 o'clock I ate here, and this was the address of the restaurant. But you can probably tell me the layout of the vacation and how things looked, and you can set the scene. And virtual reality just evokes a visceral reaction because you feel like you're there. And even if it isn't high quality, high fidelity, we don't necessarily need that right now. But our brains can just recognize that we're somewhere different and we're focused in that environment. And I think that that is extremely powerful. Are you, are you open to sharing any of your experiences on your emotional connection through that realm? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, I think one piece that comes to mind is it came out, I want to say in 2015, 2016, um, but it was called Traveling Well Black. And it toured a lot of festivals and the festival circuit and it won a lot of awards, but the idea was um, taking place in, I believe the 1950s or so, and you are um, a person of color who is traveling throughout the South. And just what is it like to interact with other people in that environment, to walk into a place and just have somebody look at you differently and even, um, aside from those views that were taking place back in time, they also spoke with people in the present day who could remember and speak from their experience. And it's different from watching a video because you do feel as if you're there with them. Even right now, we're interviewing over Zoom and cognitively my brain understands that you're not here with me. 
you are on this screen. Whereas when we're in VR, we get the ability to uh, have eye contact. And although once again, it's not high quality, my brain processes that differently. And I do feel as if you know, you're sitting across the table from me, you're driving in the vehicle next to me, you're standing next to me. Uh, and it just evokes such a strong amount of detail and memory recall. Uh, hopefully this, as, as the technology scales out, it will, you'll start to see research and studies will show an actual impact on society. I could imagine schools using something like this or at home with the parent parents to help with unconscious bias when walking around in the world and, and educating that mindset from a younger age for more empathy. It would be, it's, it sounds almost like a little like, oh, bright rainbows everywhere, but to have a more empathetic society in general, rather than the friction that seems to be getting more and more hard-coded into the DNA, that this has a potential to break through that barrier yeah, from a societal I, standpoint. I definitely agree. And we're starting to, or we are in this more globalized society where there are echo chambers that can happen for certain people that just stay sucked into social media. But then at the same time, there are people who have connected with others all across the world that they've never met because they've gotten the chance to do so with you know, connecting on Twitter or maybe even a Twitch stream or they both follow a certain game or a certain movie. And I know that I have plenty of people who have others that they consider as their best friends, but they've never met once in real life. They only know each other through the internet. And I think that those type of relationships are going to grow as we have these virtual technologies. Um, and even looking at the empathy standpoint or the learning standpoint, one thing that I'm really excited about is I could see this uh, VR becoming a really incredible learning tool where no longer do you need to pay to go to the top institution that has access to the top research equipment. Instead, you could just put on your headset and virtually be in that simulation environment, be in that learning environment. And I'm hoping that it could be a tool that makes education more accessible, but also at the same time, it's just whenever new technologies are enabled, it is a certain class of people that tend to be those who can have the first touch and first access. And that's something that I hope more people in the space are vocal about is what can we do to ensure that we're building the future for everyone and not just a small group of people. Agreed, hopefully. So my, my interest in general is emerging technology and I'm super drawn to this space because of that and the, everything else that we've already talked about so far. Um, and my understanding is that the pace of change is continuing to accelerate so faster and faster. So hopefully based on, on that, the trickle down for lack of a better phrase mm -hmm. will happen at a more rapid pace to where the technologies will get into the hands. I mean, now we have women in African villages that have phones and their own bank accounts and they influence the family now, whereas before they didn't. So maybe with education, that'll happen more quickly with everyone. Um, my, I have a lot of friends in the in their public school teachers. Mm -hmm. And th one of the things that came out of that was at more disadvantaged schools, it was harder to get the kids to a library out of a bad environment to, to access technology that they didn't have at home or an internet connection that was subpar. Maybe they were operating all on wire, wireless via cellular. And the more affluent schools were more able to get those kids connected. But for the poor schools, it was a lot more of a challenge. So I could see where the VR could, could really help, but the cost would have to come down for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely the cost would have to come down. And also when it comes to looking at the cost, I think people need to put into consideration why are these devices at a certain price point? So Facebook, they released the Quest uh, about three years ago and the Quest 2 last year. And 
the Quest 2 has a starting price point of $299, which is significantly cheaper compared to the other devices that are on the market where you're talking maybe $700, $800 starting price point. And then you also need you know, that $700, $800 PC in order to power it. And once again, even when I say cheap, for a lot of people, $300 is still a lot of money, but when compared to the other headsets that are out there and also $300 for the headset, but you don't have access to everything that's out there, you would still need to buy and download additional apps and experiences. Uh, but I bring that up because when we're talking about headset affordability, some people in this space are saying, well, maybe Facebook is also producing this cheaper headset because in the long term, if they plant their stake and plant their flag in the VR AR space, they can have access to what's known as our biometric data. And that's the data that we get from when we're in these mixed reality devices, VR headsets, and you can capture so much data when you're in there. If you think about how invasive our ads are on our social media apps right now, imagine having something strapped to your face that could potentially take into account what direction are you looking at? Specifically, eye tracking, what type of objects are you looking at? How long are you logged in for? What are you logged in? How are you moving your body when you're doing this? Um, and as the future you know, continues to grow and maybe we wear more other smart devices, what's your heart rate when you're looking at this? Um, there are wow. a lot of considerations that we need to keep in mind. And when a headset does become cheap, Hopefully that doesn't mean that our security, our data, our privacy are then compromised. That's intense to consider, especially since right now Facebook has not the best reputation when it comes to protecting the consumer. In the conversations that you're, you're having, are there any hypotheses on why the other companies choose to remain at a higher price point as opposed mm -hmm. to the Facebook model? Yeah. Well, one thing about Facebook is they're huge. They have a lot of funding to work with and Zuckerberg sees spatial computing as being the future. And by planting that stake now, by getting started now, they're ready to establish themselves as leaders. And although there are reports that show, you know, oh, we're seeing this much profit, I, I am curious what the actual you know, numbers are. Are there things that maybe we're not seeing, but they're, they're investing a lot of money into this space. And they're pumping a lot more money than other um, companies are. And so because they're pumping money, you know, they could maybe have advanced R&D that could lead to lower manufacturing cost or potentially what's rumored uh, selling their headsets at a loss leader because they know once you get the headset, you're going to buy X amount of games at X price and they'll be able to make their money back. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is interesting where will privacy go in terms of the future for spatial computing? I'm not sure if you've been following everything that's going on with Apple and Facebook right now, but Apple's trying to turn off notifications that are like give users the ability to turn off tracking, um, which is then used for advertisers. And that's how Facebook makes most of their revenue is off ads. And Apple's big push is we want to protect privacy. We want to protect user, um, but also if Apple is known as this company that protects privacy, they can also continue to then charge insanely high rates for their devices because you know that you get that trade-off, whereas maybe Facebook is cheaper, but your data is not protected. Um, and for some people, you know, they might not care uh, about their data and other people might care a lot about privacy or they might just follow a brand solely for the prestige. Um, but Apple's working in this space too. The rumor is they have about a thousand developers that are working on their next device. Um, and I've seen a lot of different rumors about what this might be or what it might look like. I don't know for sure yet, but I think we'll see more updates in about the next year or two. Privacy right now seems very socioeconomic as well. Mm -hmm. You have to pay to play, right? The more money that you have, the more you're able to pay for tools and services that protect you without hurting your customer experience in the digital realm. So yeah, that'll, it'll be interesting to see which way things, things go. 
um, between all the different platforms. What do you what now? So you've mentioned Apple and Facebook. Uh, there's HTC Vive. Mm-hmm. Vive. What, um, what about the others? Uh, what niches or what are they solving for and where do they fit within the ecosystem right now? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you do show notes, um, but I can send you a link to this graphic that somebody put together that outlines all the different headsets and what target market they seem to be appealing to. So is this consumer enthusiast um, entry business to business, really high end business to business? Uh, And so on the really high end, you have Vario, which is a headset uh, manufacturer. I think their headsets go around five or $7,000, but the headsets are said to have such a fidelity that it feels as if you are actually there and that the quality is really nice. And so for specific simulations where you need really high detail. So I know earlier I said soft skills are more popular and not as many players are in the hard skill space. But a Vario example that comes to mind is because the headsets are such high quality, they partnered up with um, an an air tower controller company and they had people do, or not air tower controller, sorry, um, some type of, I think it was a pilot training company and you did a pilot simulator in VR. Um, But the quality looks as if you're actually there, which is something that you're going to need for that type of simulator because you want to be able to clearly see all the buttons and clearly see what are the measures reading. Um, Another headset that comes to mind that's more in the B2B end is uh, the HP Reverb. Uh, I believe it's the HP Reverb G2. um, And this is a headset that's supposed to have really nice eye tracking. So most headsets right now can do gaze tracking, which is just generally what's the direction that you're looking at, but specific eye tracking is what's that specific object that you're looking at and where on that specific object are you looking? Is that Um, that going to help with the um, nausea for long-term use? I I haven't seen much about studies on eye tracking's impact on nausea. That would definitely be something that I would have to look into because I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Yeah. And another, this isn't VR, um, but it's AR and I have to bring it up because the announcement was just made at last week's Snap Developer Summit, but Snapchat is doing a lot to push the development in the AR space. And last week they had their Developer Summit and they announced the release of Snap Spectacles 4. And spectacles are their glasses that you can wear. And at least with the previous modules, you could take video and picture and then upload it to your Snapchat. Um, Maybe you could see some uh, cheesy AR overlays but these next glasses are said to be more promising, but I think they're making a really smart move where they're not releasing this to the public. Instead, it will be a private developer beta where developers will need to apply. And if Snap likes what the developer is doing, then they'll send them a pair of glasses. And the idea is to encourage people in this space to explore what are the possibilities? What are the unique use cases? What can we do with these devices? I think right, the hardware space is a hard gamble because if you don't sell, it's really hard to try to pivot out of it, um, especially when you have all these units and you're just losing so much money. Um, and I've seen other VR and AR devices be released to the public, but there's no content. And it just triggers this big dilemma where developers don't want to develop because there's no audience. Audiences don't want to buy because there's no content. And so what Snap is doing right now with their spectacles is a really smart move. And then at the same time, it's also building more hype and more curiosity because more people are wondering, oh, what will these glasses be like? What will people build? And I'm sure as developers create content, they'll probably release little tidbits online to encourage the excitement. And right now, Snap is saying that these final version of these glasses could come out in about 10 years. I hope that that number is maybe more around six or five years, but you know, we'll see. And it's always better sometimes to just overestimate than to be wrong and have the public call you out. Under um, promise, over deliver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I am excited. And even right now, I've only seen their marketing videos, but It does have about a 20 or 30 minute battery life, but still this is in the early stages. And I think we're going to see a lot of advancements in the next five to 10 years. 
Do you remember when Google first came out with their glasses mm -hmm. and people started being, they were being called glass holes? Yeah, no glass holes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, restaurants were banning people from walking in. What, what do you think is causing a shift to more acceptance? Yeah. Well, I think when you look at the time of Google Glass, not everybody quite had the smartphone yet. And now like, these devices are essentially an, an extension of our exoskeleton. Yes. where we are always glued to the screen time and always checking, not even the phone, but even smart watch it, watches. You know, everybody has their smart watch now too. Um, and I think it's just whenever you introduce a new piece of technology, a moral panic always ensues of, oh, we can't have this. This is new. This is going to change our lives. And we don't want this. Even when the first automobiles were introduced, oh, we can't have this. Or horses are perfectly fine, or these machines will explode or cause major accidents. Um, and I think Google Glass, unfortunately, was just too early, but also at the same time, it's okay that it was Google because they are a very well-funded company and they're able to introduce some ideas that might fall flat when it comes to adoption, but it's working to raise that awareness. And it's the type of needed work that you need whenever you're introducing something that's entirely new. One of the things that, that interests me still about all this, I, I think you're, you nailed it. I like that connection to the historical fear of whatever that new tech is. I was having another conversation recently where I was reading a old newspaper article where people were criticizing cement mixers, the automation and taking jobs mm -hmm. and et cetera. Um, and of course now we could, we could care less. Um, but so going to the phone, we all have them, but if I don't even change anything and I just held this up and pointed it at a person or if, when I do it, test it, people freak out and it's usually with anger. Mm -hmm. So, but they ignore traffic cameras, ATM cameras. And when people are walking around with their phones, they're getting in the shot. And now we have the cameras on cars, but it's something about the phone that, that angers people, at least video wise. And it'll be interesting to see what happens as more and more people have glasses. Are we going to require some sort of recording light like we do on our Macs or however that works, but that'll be, that'll be fascinating. Yeah, no, definitely. And even um, looking at our phones, people are afraid, oh, are you taking my picture? But then they neglect to realize all the data that's just being tracked on that device right there. And more people should be afraid of that, not getting their picture taken. That is interesting. And it, some, some of the times I think it's, it's just pure ego. We want to make sure that nobody has a bad picture mm -hmm. of us. <laughs> we we, we got to have the filter. And, and if you have hair, the hair has to be done properly, et cetera. What, um, so to answer your question, yes, I would love to see that article and mm -hmm. we'll put it in the show notes. Um, what, what are some of the interesting challenges within the, the space right now that are being worked on, like I'm seeing more with immersive audio, which sounds really cool because it's tying in more of our senses in a 360 degree way as we're living normal life. What are some of the, the other things that are being worked on right now to make the experience even better? Oh, there's, there's so many different ways that you could take it. And how do you make the headset lighter? What do you do to make the quality better? What do we do about battery life? Um, but I think what intrigues me most are probably from the UI UX end and also from the marketing and distribution end. So when it comes to UI and UX, we're at the very beginning of figuring out what is the best way to design our input and interaction modalities for these mediums. It's entirely new. And although I can try to apply the rules of web design or the rules of traditional filmmaking into what I'm building in VR, it's not going to feel quite right. And it's not going to feel intuitive. And we're still at the very beginning of writing what is that rule book for what our best practices will be. And that rule book will be continually evolving. Even now, if you go to websites that were built in the 90s, 
you might gawk and squawk and think, ooh, why did they choose this huge, thick, heavy font? And why did they put sparkles on the page? And what's going on here? This is absolutely horrendous. But at the time, there was no baseline to compare it to. These people were pioneering in the space and sometimes even just hacking away previous codes to build something entirely new. And we're at that same stage. And I think for me, sometimes I get frustrated whenever I'm in a virtual experience, which should be spatial, should be wrapped around me. And I just see flat UI components, or I'm told to use the controllers in a certain way, but it doesn't feel intuitive. It doesn't quite make sense. And even on the controller end, trying to explain to an audience how to use the controller in VR, we're still beginning how to make like those initial heuristics where we can associate you know, a device or an action to apply across different platforms. Even my computer mouse, if I showed this to somebody in the 80s, they would have no idea how this works. Yeah. But now today I can show this to even my grandfather who's 90 years old. He still every day reads the news on his computer. He knows how to type, knows how to use his mouse, knows how to use his trackpad. And we need to get to that level where we won educate us as the industry experts for how are we going to build this and what's the best way to do it, and then work on educating the audience for how to do that. And that brings it to my uh, second interesting point for me is the marketing and the distribution end. So um, in addition to the work that I do with AMP Creative, I'm also working with this really talented team from London on taking a short story from an author in the UK and turning it into an immersive storytelling experience that could be accessed in both AR and in VR. And the idea for having it accessible in both mediums is when we look at the target audience of who reads this author's books, primarily she has a lot of women who are in their mid to upper 30s, mid to upper 40s that read her books. And by having AR, we have a medium that might feel more comfortable for that initial audience where they know, okay, they can open this app on their phone and they can then see certain parts of the book come to life. And that's one format, whereas the VR is entirely more exploratory and more open world. And maybe if we can get the audience to try the AR version, they might be more intrigued to then jump into the VR version. Or we know that we can lock in the audience for AR because of that author's pre-established audience and following that she has. And for the VR version, we can try to spin it to an entirely different group of people. Um, but I'm really excited to work on that. But I think it's just a challenge sometimes because we have to think what's the best way to explain it to the audience. And even right now, I'm not trying to tell all about the project yet, uh, but we're planning on, we actually just finished our slice literally this week. Um, and so I'll probably share more information about the project within the next month or two. For people that they're listening to you talk and specifically, I want to call out young ladies. Um, I was listening to an interview on a podcast yesterday, one of the big um, startup accelerators. They only had, it was something like 18% women led. Um, so but for everybody, but let's, let's call out women here that are listening to you going, wow, this sounds really cool. Where could I go get my start? What, what, what are some of those beginner roles in a project like that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you need some writers, you need some graphic artists. What, what does all that look like? Yeah. Uh, well, adding on to that, I would say that in addition to me working in journalism, I also dabbled a little bit in the film space, but I ended up leaving film because I didn't like that complete difference for how men versus women and even the stories for women of color in the industry are treated so much differently. Uh, I remember sometimes I would walk onto film sets and I would be there with the crew and the camera crew and everybody. And then somebody would come up to me and say, hey, so you're here with craft services, right? say, no, I'm not here with craft services. I'm here with, with the camera crews here ready to shoot and make this film happen. Uh, and I, at least from my perspective, and I can't speak on behalf of everybody in the industry, 
but I do feel as if since VR and AR is a new and growing industry, you see a lot more diverse voices that are involved in this space. And that's something that also makes me really excited to go to work every day, to go to networking events, to learn more about the industry, because you just see such a wide variety of people and people who aren't here to evaluate purely solely on, you know, oh, I'm this one person and I'm the expert and I know everything, but we're all learning here and we're all willing to connect and collaborate and contribute. Um, and so for people who are interested in getting involved in this space, I mean, there are a lot of job opportunities everywhere. I would say that if you don't wear the developer hat, but you have time to learn development, it would be a really smart career move to learn some basics for Unity or Unreal and spend a couple months getting really comfortable with the tools and then maybe trying to intern for or have an apprenticeship with a company, a small game dev company or a small startup. So that way you could ask questions, admit when you don't know things, but you can really learn the practice. And then in a year or two, go off to get a bigger development role. Um, but if you don't want to have the time to learn development or you don't have the development background, then there are plenty of other opportunities in the space from project management to product management to producing um, to even, I mean, all those jobs that you had already listed were writing, marketing, uh, design, directing, just like anything. It's not one developer who has a great idea and just executes it. You need a team of strong people in order to make a great idea happen. And there's, there's the, the hardware aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the audio aspect of it. Um, are there, are there other pieces of the puzzle that, that I haven't thought through yet that people get connected with? What else is there? And then you have B2B, B2C. Yeah. The, the account management end of making sure that the clients are happy with what you're working on. Um, and even maybe for people who are interested in getting involved in the space, I would also look at the universities and see what opportunities are open on the research end too, because there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of universities are starting to really put time and money in this space because they realize that if they make the investment now, maybe that could lead to more recognition in the future. And that's another one. So there's people that invest in the space. So you have your investors. Um, research is a good one. There was another one that came to me, but so, but there's a lot of blockchain. There's a lot of opportunity here if this is really and truly exciting for people. Yeah. So that's cool. I think uh, what I like to say is we're back in the 1980s and I tell you, I work for an internet company. You, nobody really knows what the internet is and then just say, oh, okay, technology, cool. But the internet now is ubiquitous with everything that we do. Yes. I feel like we're, with the blockchain technology, we're rewriting how the internet functions. And then with AR and VR, we're rewriting our entire experience. I, I see AR being like a daily, you, you're, you're in the self-driving car and you have access to all of the tools um, more when you need to not be immersed and, mm -hmm. and have a digital overlay to life. This is an, an enhancement. And then the VR for those more immersive experiences and working out of a hybrid on a pretty much daily basis. Is, do you see something like that or are you looking in a different direction? No, I, I see this type of mixed reality version of the future as the future that I want to live in. I think if you go into the metaverse type future that's maybe was described in um, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash or in the Ready Player One book where life sucks and we just strap on the headset to escape. I don't want immersive technology as a form of escapism. I want immersive technology as something that will enhance my daily life and also bring up the lives of those around me. So talking about the education end as a tool that can make education more accessible, maybe as a tool that can show different perspectives and build empathy. Um, as a tool that maybe can just give me or even my nieces and nephews a new way to interact outside. So the obvious example that comes to mind would be Pokemon Go. Uh, and I want this technology to help us build 
a more utopian future, not something scary and escapist and dystopian. You know, I 100% agree. Um, one of the things that I liked about Ready Player Two was the call out to let's fix meat space mm -hmm. while also having the digital technologies that allow us to connect, be entertained, unwind from a, a bad day if that's necessary, um, find mental and physical health solutions, build more empathy, but we need to still protect the environment and connect in real life and et cetera. So 100% agree with you. Um, how, how do people, what's the best way to connect with you online? I would say the best way to connect with me would be to follow me or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm at Elena Peach, E-L-E-N-A-P-I-E-C-H, or follow me on Twitter at Ellie Peach, E-L-E-P-I-E-C-H. And all of those links are going to be in the show notes as well. Um, Elena, I really, really appreciate your time. This was, this was great. I loved the humanistic, well-rounded thought considering ideas that you have for your space. Your passion is definitely visible. The fact that you care comes across and I look forward to seeing what you create in the future. Yeah. And I look forward to listening to more episodes. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.